Hello, buddy. Welcome back to the Tin Man's Corner channel. I'm your host, Jeffrey Tin Man Taylor, and today I'll be reacting to another Mr. Nightmare video for you guys, and this one I'll be reacting to is Three Disturbing True Basement Horror Stories Volume 2. So as you guys recall, I already reacted to the first one, and I saw that Mr. Nightmare published this one three weeks ago, and I said in the... Uh, first one that I was going to react to this one now in another marathon so now I'm doing it so without further ado I'm going to turn the lights off move the camera up here for you guys and let's get this reaction on the road in the bag let me give you some context so the story I'm about to tell you is more understandable our cat Cosmo has always slept in the basement Every night since I was a little kid, our parents would scoop him up from wherever he was lounging and stick him in the basement. Okay. They detested all the cat hair he'd leave behind on their bed, which I guess was understandable. He was also an outdoor cat, so if one of us forgot to put him in the basement at night, he'd wake my parents up at 3 a.m. screaming to be let out. The basement's huge, the biggest room in our house, so I figured he liked having all that space. Yeah, if your cat is like rambunctious and just wants to roam around freely then you need a lot of space in your house and also I can understand having a cat will be messy because they like to roll around maybe in dirt outside just like dogs would probably or they just got too much hair that's shedding off so I know they don't like it getting all over their furniture and stuff a little over two weeks ago as I'm writing this he started acting weird there's a little landing at the top of the basement stairs just behind the door. That's where we'd usually put him. After a few minutes, he'd walk down the stairs and sleep on whatever piece of furniture he pleased. One night, I placed him delicately on the landing and gently shut the door, something I'd done a million times. As I was filling my water glass in the kitchen, though, I heard him meowing from behind the door. That was odd. He usually trotted down the stairs immediately. I finished filling my glass and walked over to the door wondering if someone had maybe forgotten to fill his dish. I opened the door, and he darted out into the living room as if he were chasing something. I checked the dish, and it was completely full. Weird, I thought, turning to go find him. I put him back on the landing step, closed the door, and that was that. The next two nights were essentially the same. I'd put him on the landing, close the door, and start getting ready for bed. After a few minutes, I'd hear him repeatedly meowing, I'd go over to the door, and it was always the same thing. He'd just linger at the top of the stairs, refusing to go down. I worried that maybe he was just getting old, but that was a thought I didn't want to confront just yet. It killed me to do it, but I just ignored him, knowing he'd walk down the stairs eventually. The day after that, he refused to enter the house at all. Usually when he wanted to come in, he'd just hang out at our front steps or by the back door until one of us saw him through the glass and let him inside. At one point... I noticed him curled up on our doormat. I went to let him in, but he didn't move. I went out and petted him a little before going back inside. A few hours later, I walked by the door again and saw that he still hadn't moved. It was getting late, so I picked him up and carried him inside, which he wasn't too happy about. I knew he didn't want to go to sleep downstairs, so I let him sleep in my room that night. It wasn't a big deal, and he seemed a lot calmer that way. Of course, that solution didn't last. For the next few days, my dad kept complaining that someone was leaving the basement door open. He was mad because it was letting all the cool air escape downstairs. Air conditioning wasn't free, which was something he loved reminding us. I assumed it was my sister. She's always been the type to leave doors and drawers open without thinking. I didn't really pay it that much thought. I was just happy that Cosmo seemed to have mellowed out after being allowed to sleep in my room. Yeah, that is kind of suspicious. Be like, uh, the cat don't want to go down in the basement. And then the doors of the basements suddenly opened, and it ain't one of the kids. Hmm. There's a stranger afoot. One night, I woke up randomly in the middle of the night. In my groggy, half-awake state, I glanced over to the door and saw something weird. There was a silhouette standing in my bedroom doorway. It was just standing there, perfectly still. I could tell it was a person because I could see their outline in the faint glow of the lamp we'd leave on in the den. I figured it had to be my sister, so I called out to her, 
but the figure moved away without a word. I was too tired to figure out what she wanted, so I just went back to sleep. A couple of days later, we discovered what had been keeping Cosmo away from the basement. A flea infestation. The whole place was crawling with them. It was disgusting. We assumed the fleas were the reason Cosmo had refused to go down there, which made sense, but it was strange how they came out of nowhere. We'd never had a flea problem before, and Cosmo always wore a flea collar. My dad yelled at my mom for not changing out his collar, even though she swore she had. My dad went all out, tearing through every corner of the basement to clean it thoroughly. We vacuumed the carpets, sprayed the entire room, and washed everything down with flea-killing solutions. He told us to stay out of the basement for the next few days so that any stragglers would die off without a host. It seemed like a good plan, and I figured that'd be the end of it. But then, a few nights later, another strange thing happened. I was lying in bed when I noticed light seeping in under my door, flickering on and off like someone was playing with the hallway switch. I told myself it was probably just my dad getting up to use the bathroom or something. But the flickering continued, going on for longer than seemed normal. It was starting to freak me out, but I... Okay, if it was your dad, he would be turning the light switch on, go to the bathroom, and then come back out and turn it off, and he ain't going to be continuously playing with the switch. So, this is weird. I lay there, heart pounding, staring at the bottom of the door, hoping it would stop. Eventually, it did. I forced myself to fall asleep after that, but I have never felt more uneasy in my life. A few more days passed without incidents. My dad said the basement was probably clear, which was great because I had been missing playing video games down there. After getting home from school, I went down to the basement. As soon as I got down the stairs, though, I noticed something was wrong. There were still fleas down there, a decent amount of them. It didn't make any sense. After all the cleaning, they should have been long gone. I went back upstairs to call my dad at work, but he just said to give it time. He insisted that any fleas left would die soon enough. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something else going on, though. It wasn't normal for fleas to keep thriving like that after everything we'd done. So the next day after school, I decided to investigate a bit further. I went down to the back of the basement and into the storage room where we kept some old boxes and tools, figuring maybe a rodent had gotten in and died somewhere. I opened the door and instantly knew I was right. The smell hit me almost immediately. This thick, rotten stench that clung to the air and made my eyes water. I followed the smell to the far end of the room, where there was an unfinished crawl space that connected to the plumbing for the whole house. It was pitch black back there, and the smell only got stronger as I stepped closer. I didn't want to go in there. It was too dark anyway. I turned to grab a flashlight, and that's when I heard it. Breathing. It was faint at first, but steady, like someone was hiding in there. I froze. I felt a pit forming in my stomach. The breathing got louder, as if whoever or whatever it was was coming closer. I backed away. Before I could react, I saw a figure lunge toward the end of the crawl space, moving fast. A hand reached out for me, but I jumped away before it could grab me. Oh, hang no. I didn't stay to get a better look. That's right. Run. I ran upstairs as fast as I could slammed the basement door shut, and called the police. When they arrived, they searched the house, but there was no sign of anyone. They found some empty chip bags and food wrappers stashed in the crawl space, but that was it. Whoever had been down there had escaped through the storm door at the back of the basement. The officer said it was probably a homeless person who'd snuck in looking for shelter, but I couldn't help but wonder how long they'd been living there and how much they'd seen. My parents were twice as shocked as I was, We've kept the basement door locked ever since, and Cosmo still won't go anywhere near that door. And I'm not surprised his dad did not even go investigate that earlier. It would be kind of creepy just finding somebody in your crawl space and be like, who the heck are you? What are you doing in our house? And you should have put two to two together when you said you saw a shadow person in your room, and then you hear your dad complaining about the door being open and everything, so that guy's crawling in your house, grabbing food, walking around, and also bringing in fleas. Oh, glad you guys washed the basement down, but, and also locked the basement door so nobody like him could get back in. 
I don't remember every detail of this story since I was only around seven, but my parents have filled in some of the gaps over the years, and there are still bits and pieces that stick out in my memory. So here goes. I'm an only child. Yeah, it kind of sucked growing up by myself, but one of the pros meant that my parents were a lot more involved in my life. They'd really go out of their way to make sure I was thriving, and I look back appreciatively on that. I kind of feel the same way, be like, you know, there's days where I felt like I wish I had a brother and sister, but then now it's like it's more calming and the parents try to help you succeed and focus on you more than like trying to handle having multiple kids, you know. But anyway, let's continue. Every year around Halloween, my parents would transform our basement into a haunted house. It wasn't anything fancy, just some old decorations, fake spider webs, strobe lights, and a lot of enthusiasm. The whole thing was for a good cause. You had to donate canned food to get in, and my parents would give everything we collected to the local food bank. They even made flyers and passed them around my school and a couple of other elementary schools nearby. The vast majority of people who came were parents of kids in my school, but there were always a handful of parents and kids that we didn't know. My parents actually welcomed that. The more strangers there were, the more food they'd be able to collect, and the greater the likelihood that the haunted house would be a hit. Sure. We lived in a pretty big brick house in Haverton, Pennsylvania. A lot of the houses in our neighborhood were fully brick for historical reasons I won't get into. That also meant that most of them were really old, too, since it was kind of frowned upon to do any remodeling. Our house was the kind of place that already had a bit of an eerie vibe to it, especially at night with its old creaky floors and dimly lit hallways. Every year, my cousins Jeff, Rick, Chaz, and Eric would come down to help my parents set up and manage the night. Usually, they'd dress up in scary costumes and hide around the basement to jump out and scare my friends. That year, they decided to go all out and wore matching anonymous masks. You know, those kind of creepy white masks with the blank expressions. Which I know what he's talking about, because I uh, painted several blank masks already. But also, I will go to a haunted house attraction or haunt that's doing it for a good cause. I mean, if it's like you got to pay with canned food or clothes or something, I, I'll be in anything to help out uh, for charity, you know. The haunted house was a big hit that year, as usual. We had a good crowd going by early evening, but my parents told me later that there had been a strange man who showed up before things really got started. He wasn't with any kids, which was odd since the haunted house was mostly for families. He said his wife was planning to bring their daughter later on, but he wanted to drop off some food cans early. My parents didn't recognize him, but they figured it wasn't a big deal. They thanked him, took the cans, and stood there awkwardly before he got the hint and left. As the night went on and more people showed up, the basement got pretty chaotic. I remember trying to keep up with my friends, who were screaming and laughing as we ran through the decorations. At one point, one of my friends came up to me crying, saying someone in an anonymous mask had scared her. I tried to calm her down and told her it was just one of my cousins, but then she said something that made my stomach drop. She said the person had grabbed her wrist and tried to pull her into a closet. I didn't know what to make of it. I thought maybe she was just being dramatic, but the look on her face told me she was genuinely scared. I went and found my parents and told them what she said. They took it seriously and went down to the basement to check things out. They asked my cousins if they had seen anything strange. Jeff, Rick, and Chaz were all in their positions, and each one of them swore they hadn't done anything like that. But then my parents noticed something else. Eric wasn't at his post. Just then, everyone started to panic. Eric came running down the stairs. He said he'd taken a break to use the bathroom upstairs, and that when he came back, his anonymous mask was gone. He figured one of the other guys had taken it as a joke. That set off alarm bells for my parents, and they immediately shut down the haunted house. They made everyone leave and called the police, who came and searched the house, but, of course, nothing turned up. That night, I was still a little shaken up, but I figured it was all over. I fell asleep easily enough, but then I woke up to this tapping sound. It was soft, but noticeable, like someone was repeatedly knocking on my bedroom window. I was too scared to get up, so I just laid there, pulling the covers over my chin, hoping I could just fall asleep. After a few minutes, the knocking stopped, and I managed to drift back to sleep. But a few hours later, I was woken up again, this time by a scratching noise. It was more urgent than the knocking had been, like someone was clawing at the window frame. 
I was terrified, but something inside me snapped and I threw the covers off and rushed to the window. I yanked open the curtains and my heart nearly stopped. There, staring back at me, was a person in an anonymous mask, only inches away from the glass. I screamed for my parents. They rushed into the room and I pointed frantically at the window, but by the time they looked, the person was gone. We called the police once again and they searched the yard and surrounding area, but they didn't find anyone. There were no signs of forced entry, no footprints, nothing. The property was clear. A few months passed and things settled down. The haunted house was just a memory by then, and my parents had started to ease up on their extra security measures. Then, one day, I came home from school to find an anonymous mask laying on my bed. Oh, hey, it wasn't no. just any mask. It looked exactly like the ones my cousins had worn that night. But the thing that really freaked me out was the writing. Scrawled across the forehead in black sharpie was my name. How the hell had that guy even known my name? We called the police again, but there wasn't much they could do besides file a report. My parents added more security cameras and made sure all the doors and windows were locked tight every night. They really went over the top with the security, adding a full alarm system and putting sensors on every window, including the upstairs ones. After that, nothing else happened. At least, not that we could prove. The next few months were fine, but I swore I kept hearing things outside my bedroom window. Tapping, scratching, you name it. It was probably nothing, but it got to the point where I was scared to sleep in my own bed. I've since grown up and moved out of that house, but sometimes I still wonder if there was more to the story behind what happened to me all those years ago. One, that guy lied of having a wife and kids, and he just donated food, you know, to have a cover story or something. And two, he figured that it would be a good time to sneak into the house, grab the boy's mask, and try to take some kids. But then after you shut down the whole haunted house, he got mad and started taunting them. And yeah, it would be creepy just to find your mask that you were missing on your bed with your name on. I said, that guy must have heard one of the uh, parents call out that boy's name. But yeah, that would be creepy. I'm glad that they beefed up security at the house. But it's shocking that he did not get caught. He truly is a uh, a disappearing act master, I tell you. I recently got a job at a Mexican joint in a neighboring town. The area was a bit sketchy, but it wasn't anything I couldn't handle. I was also pretty desperate for money, so it's not like I really had a choice. Plus, I figured working nights wouldn't be so bad, since I'd have most of the day to myself. The restaurant itself was decent enough, but the manager, Carlos, was, well, shady. He always scheduled me for the worst hours, kept me late, and never seemed particularly concerned about following the rules. He was the type of guy who made you feel like you couldn't trust him. But like I said, I didn't have much of a choice. I needed the job. One night, while closing up, I started hearing these weird noises. I was mopping the tiled floor in the kitchen when I first heard it. As I was mopping, I picked up on these two muffled sounds that sounded like soft thuds and scraping. Right. They were coming from below the floor. It was faint at first, but I knew I wasn't imagining it. The thudding and scraping would alternate, but I was positive that there were two distinct sounds I was hearing. I listened for a while, and the noises continued for a minute before stopping completely. If I was working at a restaurant and I kept hearing tapping noises or something, I'd be like, is there a ghost in here? It startled me, but I brushed it off as something small, maybe an animal outside or the pipe settling. True. It kept happening. The noise would start up when the place got quiet, just as I was finishing up my cleaning. After a few nights of this, I told Carlos about it. He shrugged it off immediately and told me it was nothing and to stop worrying. He went as far as to say the restaurant didn't even have a basement. That's when I got a little suspicious. I knew he was lying because I had literally seen the window wells around the back of the building. I wanted to tell him that, but held my tongue. I figured I'd give it another day. Maybe the noises would stop on their own. Of course, the noises continued. I complained to him the next day and told him that the place must have a basement since there were literally windows below the ground. That's when he gave me the strange look and insisted that there was no basement. 
He told me that the previous owners of the building had sealed it years ago, and no one can get in or out. Then he told me in a firm voice to just focus on my job and stop poking around. The way he said it, so dismissive and firm, gave me a bad feeling, but I didn't want to lose the job, so I dropped it. No, that guy's probably covering up something. I figured maybe it was just some animal that had somehow gotten in. It was just weird that Carlos was so insisting on not checking it out or taking me seriously. For the next few days, the noises persisted. Every night it was the same. Those strange, low thuds and occasional scraping, like something or someone was moving down there. I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right, but I tried to ignore it. And one night after closing up, curiosity got the better of me. I decided to take a look for myself. I walked around to the back of the building where the window wells were. I crouched down and tried to peer through one of the windows. It was pitch black inside, and I couldn't see anything, even with my phone flashlight. Just as I was about to give up, a light flickered on inside the basement just for a second. Then it snapped off before I could see anything clearly. I froze, my heart racing, unsure of what I had just seen. I rushed back to my car, too freaked out to go back inside, but I didn't tell Carlos. Something about the whole situation made me feel like it was better to keep quiet. I was not prepared for what was about to happen, though. The next time I closed, I couldn't resist the urge to go check out those windows again. I fully admit that my hands were shaking as I walked around the building. I knew nothing good was going to come from poking around. I crouched down to get a good look. This time, as I leaned in closer to get a better look, I saw it. Pressed up against the glass was a face. Oh, hey, no. But not just any man. He looked completely deranged. His hair was wild and his face was filthy, like he hadn't bathed in weeks. His yellow eyes were wide, staring right at me through the glass. He bashed his head against the window and gave me this demented smile. I screamed and stumbled back, totally losing my shit. I ran for my car without looking back. My hands shook as I fumbled with my keys, but I managed to get in and speed off before anything else could happen. The next day, I couldn't keep quiet anymore. I went straight to Carlos and told him everything. To my surprise, he didn't even try to deny it. Instead, he sat me down and actually told me the truth. He admitted that the person I had seen was actually his brother who had been living in the basement. He said his brother was mentally ill, dangerous even, and Carlos had been hiding him down there to keep him out of trouble. The basement had been sealed off to the public years ago, but Carlos had found a way to let his brother live down there, away from prying eyes. He urged me not to say anything, and said he'd appreciate it if I forgot this whole thing ever happened. I didn't know what to say. I wanted to quit right then and there, but I couldn't. I was so strapped for cash that the idea of looking for another job didn't feel like a real option. So I stuck around, convincing myself it would be fine as long as I stayed away from the basement. I tried to keep my head down and avoid Carlos, but the whole thing left me on edge. A few weeks later, something happened that made me regret staying. It was late, and I had just finished closing up. As I walked to my car, I noticed something or someone lurking in the tree line next to the parking lot. It was just a figure, but I knew in my gut it was a person. I had a feeling I knew who it was. My heart started racing, but I pretended not to notice. I kept walking, trying to stay calm, but then I heard footsteps behind me. I glanced over my shoulder, and there he was, the same man from the basement. He was hobbling strangely toward me, but clearly moving as quickly as he could. I scrambled for my keys and managed to unlock the door and throw myself inside just as he reached the door. He slammed his face against the window, smearing it with dirt and sweat, and started pounding on the glass. I screamed, but I couldn't think straight. All I knew was I had to get out of there. I sped off as fast as I could. I'm not sure how I made it home that night without crashing. I've never been more scared in my entire life. I still thank God that he had some kind of limp. Otherwise, he would have definitely caught me. That was my last night working at the restaurant. I called the police from the safety of my apartment, but I never went back. I didn't want to know what happened next, whether they found the man or if Carlos got in trouble for what he'd done. I just couldn't be involved anymore. Even now, though, I can't shake the feeling that Carlos might come looking for me one day. I don't know if he'd go to great lengths to do something like that, but it's a thought that sits in the back of my head. I never found out what happened to the restaurant, Carlos, or his brother, and honestly, I don't think I want to.
Maybe I'll take a drive by that restaurant sometime in the future, but for now, I want to stay as far away from that place and those people as possible. I'll be telling Carlos, uh, no, I ain't keeping my mouth shut. If your brother's mentally ill, you need to put him in a mental hospital, not no daggum basement. No, I'll be calling, uh, the police when I go back to the apartment like he said he did before his brother attacked, because that is uncalled for. But anyway, that's going to be it for now. Don't forget to like, subscribe, turn on those post notifications for more uh, Mr. Nightmare content like this. This has been another successful installment of the Tin Man's Corner channel. I'm your host, Jeffrey Tin Man Taylor. I say that's a wrap, and have a nice day. Bye.